The pandemic has highlighted for us that national security also involves the assets that we can harness and put against an invisible enemy. And that includes the healthcare providers, the nurses, the doctors, um, the aides that are serving in assisted living facilities. So many of them are made up by refugees and other immigrants. That's the voice of Krish Omera Vignaraja, president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. But first, here are your co-hosts, Joe Cirincioni and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to Press the Button. Today is our 55th episode, and we are entering our seventh week of COVID-19 lockdown. That's right. And we have a lot of news to cover despite the pandemic. On early warning today, we'll be unpacking the recent State Department report claiming that Russia and China are maybe probably conducting nuclear tests. Spoiler alert. We highly doubt that. And the Trump administration's latest efforts to destroy the Iran deal. After early warning, Joe and I sit down with Krish Omera Vignaraja. Krish is the president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. She previously served in the Obama White House as the policy director for First Lady Michelle Obama. What a great job that must have been. And at the State Department as a senior advisor for Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. Okay, so why is a nuclear policy and national security podcast talking with her? Because we think our issues are related. Because in order to understand fully the problems in one set of national security issues, we have to understand the problems in the others. For example, if you are in favor of a Green New Deal and you're seeking funds to reduce the damage from climate change, well, you can find them in the overstuffed and unnecessary nuclear weapons budget. And When we're trying to work to reduce the fears and insecurities that drive some Americans to want more weapons, including nuclear weapons, well, we have to address the irrational fears they have of immigrants to our country. Here at Press the Button, we're dedicated to expanding our definition of national security, to exploring these interconnections, and you'll be hearing uh, more such interviews in the weeks ahead. We speak with Krish about the work she does to help refugees and immigrants find a new home in the United States. She details her own story, one similar to many of the people she works with, and how her crucial work has changed in the face of the pandemic. I really learned a lot in this interview, and and we approach it just from a place of of curiosity and and trying to understand um, the challenges in immigration. And, And for me, it was just a moment where I could see this cycle about how the choices we make in foreign policy have these downstream effects, you know, and and how we need to start thinking more holistically Mm. about that in order to make policy. We've talked before on Press the Button about what it would mean to have a feminist foreign policy for the U.S., which would reconsider what factors affect our security, such as health, climate change, and, and doesn't assume that military solutions are going to solve all of our problems. And Chris really breaks down how her work with refugees and immigrants intersects with our own concepts of national security and, and how it, her work is necessary um, to making us safer. The three of us had a really great conversation, and I think you're going to love it. And if you do like it, please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter. We're at Press Button Pod, at Press Button Pod. It's a great way to stay up to date on the show's latest news. You'll see who we're interviewing in advance, as well as any bonus content that we come out with. And today I'll be asking Joe a question submitted by Mark from Massachusetts. If you have a question that you would like Joe to answer on the air, you can tweet at us or DM us with it. If you're not on Twitter, but you'd still like to support Press the Button, give the show a rating on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in this morning. We've got a lot to cover, and the clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Joining me today is Daryl Kimball, Executive Director of the Arms Control Association, and Mary Kaczynski, Deputy Director of Policy here at Plowshares Fund. Welcome, both of you. Thanks, Michelle. 
Thanks very much. So you know the drill. Um, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear news, which starts now. Daryl, the State Department recently released its arms control compliance report, which raised concerns about Russia and China's compliance with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. What do these findings mean? Well, this is a reiteration of earlier U.S. accusations from the Trump administration that Russia and China are engaging in activities that are inconsistent with what's called the zero yield standard that was established by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So these charges were first raised in the spring of last year, 2019. And the United States has not, in this report uh, or in earlier statements, explained why exactly they believe Russia and China are not meeting the standards established by the CTBT. They suggest that uh, each of these countries are using containment chambers and are engaged in activities at their former test sites that are indicative of nuclear test explosions. And this seems to be part of the administration's efforts to depict Russia as a serial treaty violator. Russia has violated some other treaties. And also, it seems to be part of their effort to depict China's nuclear arsenal as small but vastly growing. We have raised questions about the veracity of these claims. We have pointed out that the best way to clarify whether one or another signatory to the Conference of Test Ban Treaty is complying with the treaty would be for the United States, which is signed, to ratify the treaty. Because when you ratify the CTBT, it can help move it towards entry into force. And with entry into force, you've got the option of short notice on-site inspections. And even before you have entry into force of the treaty, which may be years off, there is the option for the United States and Russia or the United States and China to use diplomacy to resolve these kinds of compliance concerns. The treaty itself suggests that confidence building measures, exchanging information about activities at former test sites, site visits, that could be negotiated in order to clarify concerns that one or another country might be conducting very low yield nuclear test explosions. So the last thing I would just note is that the zero yield standard is something that U.S. officials have also accused Russia and China of not agreeing to, which is incorrect. Their earlier State Department fact sheets and statements that make it clear that all of the nuclear testing countries, uh, or at least the, the, the five original nuclear weapon states, all agreed that any release of nuclear energy from a self-sustaining nuclear reaction is prohibited by the CTBT. So it's the, the pot calling the kettle black here, the Trump administration, they're not taking the steps necessary to resolve this issue. And it's, it's a, a reason, I think, for the international community to respond and to point out that entry into force of the CTBT is the best way to resolve these kinds of issues, which may come up in the years ahead again and again. Thanks, Daryl. Mary, Iran and the JCPOA have continued to be in the news despite the pandemic. Um, last week, you know, Trump said that if Iranian boats are harassing U.S. ships, U.S. ships will shoot them out of the water. Um, just in the past few days, we heard, have heard reporting in major news outlets that Pompeo is about to try to make the case that the U.S. is still a part of the JCPOA in order to use the so-called snapback mechanism in order to, um, you know, put increasing sanctions on Iran. What is the status of this relationship? What do you expect to happen next? Well, first, the really good news. Michelle, you highlighted the tweet that Trump sent last week threatening Iran. The good news is that that has not led to increased conflict in the region. And that really was the danger when the commander in chief makes a threat like that. It could easily spiral out of control. Uh, the Pentagon has clarified, however, that there has been no change in the rules of engagement. It was just a tweet. That's not to downplay it. It's still a very tense situation. Both sides need to de escalate. But so far, we have avoided a major conflict. 
The bad news, however, is this story that the Secretary of State has indicated he's preparing a legal opinion that the U.S. is still party to the JCPOA. All JCPOA participants can invoke the snapback of previous U.N. sanctions on Iran that would dissolve the JCPOA and bring back into play all of those former U.N. sanctions. On the surface, this is a really ridiculous argument, right? Because the U.S. explicitly withdrew. U.S. officials have consistently stated that the U.S. is no longer a participant. So it seems like this is kind of a Hail Mary pass. But we shouldn't dismiss this possibility. You know, it's a difficult legal situation, kind of a gray area. So it really depends on how the other U.N. security, the other JCPOA participants, the U.N. Security Council, how they react to this U.S. ploy and how Iran reacts. Thanks, Mary. In our last minute, um, I'm sure both of you have seen the uh, reports about uh, whether Kim Jong-un, leader of North Korea, is alive, dead, in some sort of, you know, under severe medical distress. What do you make of these reports? Well, it's very difficult to understand what the the facts are. Uh, Facts are hard to come by out of North Korea, and the reporting so far is pretty thinly sourced. I think one of the things we have to remember is that the diplomacy between the United States and North Korea in the last three years has been very personality-driven. And if there's a leadership vacuum in in North Korea, uh, it would be a further blow to the already stalled uh, Trump-Kim diplomatic efforts. But I think most importantly, if there's a leadership vacuum in North Korea, the United States and other countries in the region need to think about how to avoid miscalculation that could lead to a conflict as North Korea is dealing with that event and uh, is also probably dealing with the severe effects from the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's hope we don't have yet another crisis on our hands on the Korean Peninsula. And with that, our time is up. Thank you, Daryl and Mary, for joining. Thanks so much. This is Michelle, and I am here today with Krish Omera Vignaraja and my co-host, Joe Serencioni. Krish, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. We're so glad that you could join us. We just have a lot of questions about things that have happened just in the last few weeks, and we want to jump right into it, if you don't mind. Uh, Let's start with Donald Trump's new immigration policy. It's frankly confusing to a lot of us, and I'm married to an immigration attorney, and I don't understand what's happened. Can you tell us what this new policy is and what it means for immigrants and refugees trying to get into the United States? Yeah, it's it's confusing to many of us um, who work on these issues day in and day out. And I think part of that was because there was the preview of it by tweet. And then, of course, we all saw the executive order that actually came out on paper. So he signed an executive order that will prevent at least tens of thousands of immigrants abroad from moving to the U.S. on a new green card for the next 60 days. It may be extended beyond that, but we know at least uh, for the moment it's 60 days. By some experts' estimates, the executive order would gut legal immigration levels by um, a little less than a third. So who will this impact? It'll temporarily prohibit people outside the U.S. from getting green cards. It temporarily bans green card holders in the U.S. from sponsoring a spouse or child for permanent residency. And then the other major category is it will ban family members of American citizens from coming over. So those seeking green cards for a parent, an adult child over 21, or a sibling. So essentially, uh, what the order does is it'll prolong the separation of immigrant families. And in some cases, families of U.S. citizens. So that may sound surprising because obviously the preview of it, the emphasis was was intended to be economic. And, and why did the president do this? Or should I say, why did the president and Stephen Miller do this? Yeah, um, I have tried to avoid getting into either of their heads. Um, but the text of the order is full of language purporting that economic factors uh, are the motivation um, of this action. But but saying this order is needed to protect American workers um, plays into the, 
patently flawed idea that American prosperity um, is a zero sum game. And to the contrary, I mean, we do a lot of workforce development work with our clients across the country. We see consistently that immigrants are, they're essential workers, they're entrepreneurial, they're tax paying, they're job creating members of society. And so they are critical to the growth and, and vitality of our economy. This would be a good place to talk about what your organization does. Can you tell us a little bit about the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service? Yeah, sure. Um, so we just celebrated our 80th anniversary. Um, so Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm told that I hide our age well, um, so take that <laughs> as a compliment. So, you know, we began in 1939 helping refugees resettle as Lutherans were displaced by the Second World War, but our mandate quickly expanded. We worked with Cuban refugees, Vietnamese refugees, the lost boys and girls of Sudan. Today, many of the refugees we work with come from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, but our work has expanded. So some of our work for focus on refugees, but a lot of it these days actually focuses on children and, and families. Um, when the family separation crisis hit last summer, we were one of two organizations that the government turned to to help reunify families. So much of our work today is um, working with unaccompanied minors who come across the border. We set up operations in New Mexico and in Arizona as the asylum seekers. We dealt with an influx um, and helped them get uh, the family members they had across the country. Um, so we work on a range of issues with um, newly arrived immigrants, but we also work with new immigrants in terms of workforce development, upskilling. Uh, we have partnerships with Walmart, Starbucks. We work, uh, some of that is focused on youth, trying to make sure that as they age out of school, um, we set them up for success in terms of landing that first job, but not, you know, ensuring that it's not a dead end job um, so that they can get to the next level as well. So you've talked a little bit about the most recent administration actions around um, immigration and, and kind of the broader context, but when it comes to the pandemic, how is it influencing immigration? Yeah, um, it's taken a significant toll, um, just as it has on so many of us, truly, on the clients that we serve. Refugees have experienced everything from layoffs to food insecurity to childcare challenges, to the bureaucratic hurdles of trying to apply for any sort of, you know, one-off payments, to the mental and emotional distress. We've seen that for many of our clients, they have suffered significant layoffs, reduced hours, uh, because so many of them, when they go into those first-time jobs, they are working in the service, hospitality, um, rideshare industries. Um, we're also seeing that, um, you know, for many of them who are just trying to make ends meet right now, it's been incredibly challenging for them to try um, to even apply for unemployment, to navigate the complicated process. You know, it's, it's difficult because for some of them, they're dealing with language barriers, fear of the system, just because up until this point, you know, it's, it's been one that they've been so focused on maintaining their eligibility that some of the kind of witch hunt that we've seen in the last few years has created this dynamic that either they don't know the community resources that are available to them or they're fearful to try to access those resources for fear of re repercussions. Um, and then for those lucky few who, you know, are able to maintain jobs, many of them are risking their lives so that we maintain some semblance of ours. Um, they're working in, you know, meat packing, meat processing plants, grocery stores, warehouses for single parent households. Um, they're dealing with the school and daycare closures and, and they don't have any sort of nest egg to tap into because, you know, they, they have obviously just come to this country. And then for their children, the children are dealing with distance learning being a challenge when for so many of them, they're still trying to master English as a second language. So one example of uh, the kind of um, refugee who comes here and very quickly becomes an invaluable contributor is a gentleman I came across, uh, Joseph Lewis. Um, so I got to know him because he was an alumni of our Migrant and Refugee Leadership Academy program. So Joseph was born and raised um, by a single mother in Liberia. By the time he was 13 years old, there was a civil war raging in his home country. 
So he would watch as rebel soldiers would take his mother away on multiple occasions. Um, each time he was fearful that he may never see his mother again. Um, the reason why this happened regularly was because his mother's last name was very similar to that of the president at that time. So the kids would just sit around and cry, not knowing what would, what would happen. Um, so at 15, they fled to, to the Ivory Coast. Um, his mother got sick, so he was forced to work. And the only job that he could find was working in a literal swamp. So at the end of long days, he would describe to me how he would step out of the swamp and, and before getting home, he would have to peel the leeches off of his legs and know that the very next day he would be doing the exact same thing. He lived that way for several years. And, you know, thank God for him. He was eventually resettled in America. Um, he, you know, sometimes uh, refugees, they struggle. The support that we can provide is only for a few months. So he had some dark times in his life and actually became homeless for a little while on the streets of Washington, D.C., uh, but like so many refugees, Joseph isn't the kind of guy to give up. The incredible resilience and perseverance we see in so many of these refugees is inspiring. And, and luckily, the community didn't give up on him either. So, you know, what I'm kind of proud to report today is that Joseph is a police officer in Washington, D.C., in the Metropolitan Police Department. Um, he's a community leader. He sometimes joins us in meetings with congressional leaders to share his story and lobby for compassionate, common sense policies, because I do think putting a face to a name and, and to what we describe as refugees is incredibly important because it is why this program is it's just not the right thing to do. Um, it's also the smart thing to do as Americans. That tells us a great deal about why refugees contribute to America. My own grandparents were, were immigrants fleeing the economic and the political dislocations in southern Italy at the turn of the last century. Uh, but but why, how does this impact national security? You work at a very personal level, as you just told us with the story with Joseph, and you know, individuals. Do you see the current pandemic or the current U.S. policies having an impact on U.S. national security overall? Absolutely. I mean, I think the pandemic has highlighted for us that national security also involves the assets that we can harness and put against an invisible enemy. And that includes the healthcare providers, the nurses, the doctors, um, the aides that are serving in assisted living facilities. So many of them are made up by refugees and other immigrants. And this is where I'm never one to miss an opportunity to bust a myth. Um, I think repeatedly you hear this claim that refugees are actually a potential threat instead of a defense to our national security, that, you know, terrorists are trying to slip into the country undetected, that this is why we have to close our borders. And the fact of the matter is that refugees are the most vetted immigrants of any kind. We're talking more than a dozen different background checks, security checks, fingerprinting, health screening, in-person interviews with DHS. It's partly why it takes us sometimes years. And so it's safe to say that any would-be terrorist attempting to game the system would be sorely disappointed. Um, we've seen studies that show that immigrants, uh, refugees, actually make our country safer. There was a study done on the top 10 cities that absorb refugees per capita, and nine of the 10 had significant improvements in um, violent crime and economic crime uh, crime across the board. The one exception was actually West Springfield, Massachusetts, and it was because they were undergoing a um, epidemic, uh, the opioid epidemic at the time. And so this is where I just think it's really important to highlight that refugee resettlement, these kinds of programs have always had bipartisan support. And this is important as a national security issue because just as the U.S. Um, accepts refugees, we can't do this alone. Right now, we're talking about 72 million refugees around the world. It takes a global coalition of nation states to do this. And we used to lead the world in accepting refugees. We were an exemplar. Ronald Reagan actually resettled the highest number of refugees of any president. We resettled more refugees under Republican administrations than we have Democratic ones. And so this is where it is critical for us to do this, not just because it's in our own interests, 
but it's also how we show and lead the way so that other nations do this as well. As you describe, you know, the, the, the drivers of uh, migrate, forced migration, or, you know, the reasons people might choose to immigrate, it really recalls to me uh, an earlier episode we had on this podcast where we were talking about uh, a feminist foreign policy and, and what are the elements of a feminist foreign policy. And I think one of the principles I walked away with from that was this broader sense that the decisions that we make in foreign policy, whether it's who we are selling, the U.S. is selling arms to, who are our allies, where our bases are located, where our aid is going, all of those have effects in this cycle that lead to other things happening that can lead to conflict or decrease conflict that may therefore influence immigration or migration. I'm curious to hear how this, this concept of a broader cycle resonates with you and and this idea that as we think about national security, we have to think about it more broadly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, when you describe that, what comes to mind for me is the dynamic that we have seen with MS-13. Some people believe that this is a national security threat that was birthed abroad and, and came here to America. And the truth is it's actually the exact opposite. MS-13 began in LA in the 1980s. We exported it to half dozen countries as we deported these individuals. And it was, you know, it was it was born in the population of migrants coming from Central America that frankly we did nothing um, to support, even though it was some of the instability that our foreign policy caused that led to that migration. And so when, you know, and I'm not making excuses um, by any stretch of the imagination, just describing objectively um, history. And, and as they sort of stooped in squalor in L.A. Is, is how this gang was created. And so now when you see their activity in Central America um, and other nations that have large Central American populations, that's where you see this, this kind of gang and, and criminal activity. Um, But the implication in terms of our national security that we also see is that the refugee resettlement program is also the program that welcomes Iraqi and Afghani immigrants who assist U.S. missions abroad. So I can give you an example of a gentleman that we were able to resettle um, who served along our U.S. troops in Iraq. His name was Kareem. Um, Kareem, he's a Kurdish man from Iraq. Um, he took great risk uh, to himself, um, his family. He served as a translator, assisting our troops um, who were in Iraq. And, you know, you have to understand that any association with American forces can bring incredible danger, um, not just to the translator, um, but also to, to their family. So he was deputized as an interpreter for U.S. troops soon after the invasion in 2003. Um, his village was in northern Iraq, and they welcomed the U.S. invasion that toppled Saddam Hussein. So he worked as a liaison between U.S. troops and local workers that were marshaled to bring water projects um, to the area. As the war continued, Kareem eventually had to flee Iraq because of threats, and he came um, and was settled in the United States. Um, He became a naturalized citizen. He made his home amongst other Iraqis in Lincoln, Nebraska, with his wife and and four children. He actually works now as part of our network um, with uh, Lutheran Family Services in Nebraska. But, you know, his plight could have been very different if we hadn't ensured his safe passage to America. Um, His friend Mohammed, who was a doctor who served the U.S. mission, was murdered by insurgents in 2012, killed in his own clinic. Um, Another interpreter he knew, Coptic Christian, was beheaded in 2004. And this is where, you know, um, rangers and other U.S. forces, you know, talk about how we, we leave no man behind. This has always been the mantra um, of, of the military. And, and when we talk to our national security colleagues, they are some of our most vocal advocates on this. It was General Mattis who actually wrote that the failure to honor our commitment to those who have supported the U.S., would undermine our diplomatic and military efforts by making it difficult to sustain the support of partners elsewhere. And this is where, when we talk to national security experts, they fear that if we don't meet our promise 
we will have difficulty when we need to wage the next war. Do you at the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service work with other organizations to try to uh, increase your impact on national policy? Yeah, we know that we can't do it alone, um, particularly as we've experienced what uh, I think you can only describe as a war on immigration and immigrants. We know that we need to build a united front. So last year, we collaborated with organizations like um, Hispanic Heritage Foundation around a campaign responding to threats of mass deportations um, from the administration. We've worked with LULAC and other organizations like them. I I've spoken with a number of the women's and, and children focused organizations, knowing that we deal with everything connected to human trafficking, domestic violence, family separation. Um, we're also working at the intersection of the climate crisis and immigration. So we've worked and reached out to a number of environmental and conservation organizations as well. Just last week um, on Earth Day, we recorded a video with the National Wildlife Federation because some of our work is very much focused on how the climate crisis is affecting migration. Uh, two thirds of the migrants that we see today are actually a result of climate displacement compared to some of the more traditional threats like violence and persecution. And this is only going to get worse going forward. This is so interesting. We are increasingly seized at Plowshares Fund with the idea that we have to form a united front with other organizations. So we have to take our nuclear policy issue and wed it more organically with things like uh, social justice, c climate justice. We, we could learn from you on how to forge those united fronts. Is this something new for you? And are you, are you seeing this develop? And what kind of reaction are you getting from these other groups? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is actually some real excitement for us to break down the traditional operational barriers of how we've carved out our mandates, because um, I think we know that the intersectionality is where we are going to be the most effective. And there really has been a very warm reception to try to figure out how to collaborate. That's been really heartwarming. And I think part of it is that, you know, we all know we bring unique perspectives. For us, you know, there was a discussion after Hurricane Katrina on how the resettlement agencies could actually use the expertise that we've developed over literally decades resettling foreigners in the U.S. and how we could apply that to actually Americans who needed to relocate. Um, and I think that that's where there's some real growth opportunities. Krish, it has been fabulous to have you on here and to learn more about your work. How did you get involved? What, what drew you to this issue? Working um, in immigration um, in, in many ways feels like coming full circle. Uh, I was born in Sri Lanka um, at a time when the country was on the brink of civil war. My parents are part of the ethnic and religious minority. Uh, we knew that we had to get out of the country, but unfortunately at that time it wasn't clear that there was any country that would take us in. Finally, my parents had a lead, so we were actually going to move to Nigeria, specifically northern Nigeria, where, you know, they didn't know this at that point, but 200, uh, you know, 276 girls would get kidnapped just for trying to go to school. Um, both of my parents were teachers, and that's how we had that opportunity. So we had plane tickets in hand, bags packed, ready to move. And just in the nick of time, we learned that um, our visas were actually going to be processed and we had uh, the good fortune of, of being able to come to the U.S. We didn't really know a whole lot of folks at that point. Uh, my parents came with no jobs, just about $200 in their pockets and two very young kids in their arms. And it was because Americans embraced us that I got the chance to work at the State Department for a few years, and then, then ultimately work at the White House as uh, the First Lady um, Michelle Obama's policy director. So when this opportunity came up, I leapt and took it because I really do think that um, America will always be its strongest when it remembers its history of being a nation born and built by immigrants. Uh, I know we are always going to go through these trying times of people politicizing the issue, stoking xenophobia. Um, but what is so inspiring and what I have the good fortune to work on um, and see every day 
is the Americans who push back, the people who do overnight shifts in Arizona and New Mexico, who welcome asylum seekers, who donate to our food banks, who donate diapers so that families can have some basic necessities as they come to this country. And so that's the America I know that will, at the end of the day, prevail. But, you know, we're going to go through our bumps every now and again. Well, Krish, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Where can our listeners go for more information on your organization? Sure. Um, would love if anyone would take a look at www.lirs.org and you can learn more about the work we do and the campaigns we'd love people to get engaged with. Well, thank you so much for everything you're doing and for taking the time to come and talk to us about it. Krish Vignaraja, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Joe, are you ready for today's question? (laughs) Yes, let's go. Mark from Massachusetts wants to know, aside from the Cuban Missile Crisis, what is the closest the United States has been to nuclear war since 1945? Oh, wow. Okay. I have my favorite. And I'll tell you, there's been there's been about a dozen accidents um, involving U.S. nuclear forces, and some of these involved uh, bombs that we've accidentally dropped. We almost eliminated uh, North Carolina, for example. We dropped bombs off of Greenland, off of Spain. So we've had a number of nuclear accidents. The exact number of accidents isn't known. But those would have been accidents, not a war. Wars almost started because of our early warning system having computer malfunctions, um, radar misinterpretations. In one case, a, a training tape was accidentally inserted into the NORAD headquarters. And for, for 10, 15 minutes, the, all of NORAD thought we were under Soviet attack and we almost launched our missiles. But the closest we've come since the end of World War II is because of a Russian mistake not our mistake. And it was 1995, 1995, when Boris Yeltsin was president and Bill Clinton was president here. Relations were good. And because of the deterioration of the Russian early warning system, their radar wasn't as good as it used to be, at least as we thought it used to be. And so they mistook a Norwegian weather rocket that was launched from from the Barents Sea uh, for being a U.S. submarine-launched ballistic missile. Uh, the Norwegians had warned them about the test, but it hasn't, hadn't gotten all the way up to the military, so they didn't know about it. And in some uh, nuclear attack scenarios, this is how a nuclear attack would begin. We'd launch a single a high-yield weapon, blow it up over M- Moscow or over Russian territory to blind their radars, followed by a salvo of hundreds of U.S. missiles. That's what the military thought was happening. For the first time in Russian history, they opened up the nuclear football that Russia has following their president at all time. And they told Yeltsin that we were under attack uh, and that he had to fire the Russian missiles before the the bombs went off. Fortunately, Yeltsin wasn't drunk at the time. We don't know exactly what happened in that room, but he concluded that his friend Bill Clinton wouldn't be doing this. There must be some mistake. He was right. There was no explosion. Things calmed down. He closed the football and we dodged a bullet. So the question is, what would happen now? If something like that happened, what would Putin think? Or for that matter, Kim Jong-un or the Chinese or any other of the authoritarian leaders that have the control to launch their nuclear weapons whenever they want for whatever reason they want, would they be as confident that the U.S. wasn't attacking them? So when you look at the command and control situation, you have to look not just at the U.S. systems, but at the other country's systems and realize we have a big problem here. There is no technological fix. You cannot rule out all the kinds of mistakes that would happen. That's why it is so important to reduce the numbers of nuclear weapons, to take them off this high alert status, to have universal adoption of things like no first strike policies. There's a whole lot of things you can do to reduce the risk that because of some miscalculation or accident or madness, the entire world will be destroyed. I talk about this in the um, participant media documentary, Countdown to Zero. By the way, plug, if you haven't seen Countdown to to Zero, it's still the best uh, documentary. Uh, After you've seen Contagion, also by participant media, go watch Countdown to Zero. There's a whole lot of catastrophic threats we have to be aware of. Another week, another question. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Mark.
Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Zender, Alex Spire, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.